The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, Chapter 5 The man who had nowhere to go. The early morning, it was the second morning after my recovery, I believe the fourth after I was picked up. I woke through an avenue of tremendous, tumultuous dreams, dreams of guns and howling mobs. I came sensible to horse shouting above me. I rubbed my eyes and lay listening to the noise, doubtful for a little while, my whereabouts. Then came a sudden pattering of bare feet, a sound of heavy objects being thrown about, a violent creaking and a rattling of chains. I heard a swish of water as the ship was suddenly brought wind round, and its foamy yellow-green wave flew across the little round window and left it streaming. I jumped into my clothes and went on deck. As I came up the ladder, I saw against the flushed sky, for the sun was just rising, the broad back of red hair of the captain, over his shoulder and puma, spinning from a shackle, rigged on a mizzen, spank a boom. The poor brute seemed horribly scared and crouched at the bottom in its little cage. Overboard of them, brawled the captain, overboard of them. We'll have a clean ship soon, the whole bill of them. He stood in my way, so I had perforce to tap his shoulder to come on deck. He came around with a smart and staggered back a few places to stare at me. He needed no spectacled eye to say, tell the man was still drunk. Hello, said he stupidly. Then with a light coming into his eyes, why, it's Mr. It is Mr. Mr. Pedrick Dick. Pendick, said I, Pendick. Be damned, said he. Shut up. What's your name, Mr. Shut Up? There's no good answering the boot. But I certainly did not expect his next move. He held out his hand to the gangway, which Montgomery stood talking to a massive grey-haired man in dirty grey-blue flannels, who had apparently just come aboard. That way, Mr. Mr. Blasted Shut Up, that way, while the Captain Montgomery's companion turned as he spoke. What do you mean, I said. That way, Mr. Blasted, shut up. That's what I mean. Overall, Mr. Shut up. And sharp. You clean the ship out. Clearing. Cleaning the whole blessed ship out. Over oh, you go. He said him dumbfounded. Then it occurred to me that exactly the thing I wanted. The lost prospect of the journey is a soul passion of this quarrelsome sot. With one to mourn over, I turned towards Montgomery. Can't you, can you have, can't have you, said Montgomery, companion concisely. You can't, you can't have me. I said, Gas, he had a square, the most resolved face I set my eyes upon. Look here again, turning to the captain. Overboard, said the captain. His ship isn't for beasts and cannibals, the worst than beasts any more. Overboard you go, Mr. Shut up. If you, they can't have you, then you goes overboard, but it's anyhow you go. With your friends are done with your blessed island of forevermore, a mini. I've had enough of it. I'm in. I've had enough of it. But Montgomery appealed. He just saw his lower, his lower lip, nodded his head and hopelessly, the grey-haired man beside him, indicated his powerless to help me. I see you presently, said the captain. Then began a curious three-cornered altercation. I turned to thee. I appealed to one and the other, the three men, first to the grey-haired man to let me land, and then to the drunken captain to keep me on board. Even broad in trees, to the sailors, Montgomery said neither were, never a word, only shook his head. You're going overboard, I tell you. Was the captain of fame? Lord be damned, I am king here. At last I could must confess my voice suddenly broke in the middle of a fret. I felt a gust of hysterical pantalage, and went off and stared dismally at nothing. We must say the sailors progressed rapidly. With the task of then shipping the packages and cage animals, a large launch to the two young standing lugs lay under the lee of the corner. In a strange assortment of goods were strung. I did not then see the hands of the island that were receiving the packages. The whole launch was hidden from me by the side of the schooner. Neither Montgomery nor his companion took the slightest notice of me, but buried themselves in assisting and directing the four five sailors who were unloading the goods. The captain went forward, interfering, interfering rather than insisting. I was eternally despairful and desperate once or twice. I stood waiting there for other things to accomplish themselves. 
I could not resist an impulse to laugh at my miserable quandary. I felt of retria for the lack of b- b- breakfast, hunger, lack of blood corpses, took all the manhood from a man, I perceived pretty clearly. I had not the stamina neither to resist that the captain chose to do to spell me or to force upon myself upon Montgomery's companion. So I awaited passively upon fate, and the work of transferring Montgomery's possessions to the launch went on, so as if I did not exist. Presently the work was finished, and then came a struggle. I was hauled, resisting weakly, though, enough to the gangway. Even as at then I noticed the oddness of the brown faces of the men who were well, we were gone we in the launch, but the launch was now fully laden and was shoved off hastily. A brawling gap of green water pro- appeared under me. I pushed back with all my strength to avoid falling headlong. The hands of the launch shuddered derisively. I heard a Montgomery curse at them. Then the, ca- then the captain, the mate, one of the seamen help him, helping him, ran, ran me aft towards the stern. A dinghy of the Lady Vane, been towing behind, it is half full of water, no oars, and quite unsuspectable. I refused to go aboard her, I flung myself full length on board deck. In the end, they swung me into her, but I rope, for they had no stern ladder. They then cut me adrift, I drifted slowly from the schooner in a kind of stumper. I watched all the hands come to the rigging, and slowly but surely she came round into the wind. The sails fluttered and then bellied out as the wind came on to Then I stared at her weather-beaten side, heeling steeply towards me. Then she passed out of my range of view to view. I could not turn my head to follow her. At first I would scarcely believe I, what had happened. I crouched at the bottom of the dinghy, stunned and really staring blankly in the vacant, oily sea. I realised I was in a little hell of mine oh, again. I now half swamped, looking back over the gunwale. I saw the schooner standing away from me, with the red-haired captain mocking at me for the turf tail and turning towards the island, saw the launch growing smaller as she approached the beach. Abruptly the cruelty of this desertion came clear to me. I had no means of reaching the land lest I should re- chance to drift there. I was still weak, but you must remember from my exposure of the boat in the boat. I was empty and very faint. I should have had more heart, but if I was suddenly began to sob a weep I've never done done again done since a little child. The tears ran down my face in a passion of despair and struck my feet at the water at the bottom of the throat and kissed savagely at the gunwale. I prayed aloud for God to let me die. Chapter 6 The Evil Looking Boatman. Men. But the islanders, seeing that it was slowly adrift, took pity on me. I drifted very slowly to the eastward, approaching the island startlingly, and presently I saw the hysterical relief. A launch came round and returned towards me. She was heavily laden. I could make out, as she drew nearer, Montgomery's white haired, broad shouldered companion, sitting cramped up with the dogs and several packing cases and stern sheets. His individual stared fixedly at me, without moving or speaking. Black faced cripple was glaring at me fixedly in the bows near the puma. There were three other men besides, three strange, brutish looking fellows to whom their stack hands were snarling savagely. A grammy who was staring brought the boat to by me, and rising caught the fastened my painter to tell her to tow me, for there was no room aboard. I recovered from my hysterical phase by this time and answered his hall as I approached bravely enough. I told him the dinghy was nearly swamped, reached me in pigginning. I was jerked back for the rope fast, straight tightened between the rope boats. For some time I was busy bailing. It was not until I had got the water under 
the water in the dinghy had been shipped, a boat of perfectly sound. I had leisure to look at the people in the launch again. By her man, I found was still regarding me steadfastly, but with an expression, as I fancied, of some prosperity. When my eyes, when my eyes met his, he looked down at the second and sat between his knees. He was a powerfully built man, as I have said, had fine forehead and rather heavy features. But his eyes had the odd trooping the skin above the lids, which often comes with advancing years. A fell of his heavy mouth as the corners gave him expression of punctilious resolution. He talked to Montgomery in a tone too low for me to hear. For time, for him, to my eyes travelled to this furry man. Strange crew they were, and he saw their faces, yet there was something in their faces. I knew not what. They gave me a stern spur, spasm to jest. I looked steadily at them, and the expression did not pass, though they failed to see what was the which, which, what occasioned it? It seemed to me that, that we, to be brown men, but their limbs were oddly swayed in some thin, dirty, white stuff down even to the fingers and feet. I'd never seen men so wrapped up before. The man who is so only in the east wore turbans too, and thereupon peered at the effing face, effling, if, eff, effling faces at me, faces of protruding low jaws and bright eyes. They had lank blank hair, almost like horse hair, as seen as they sat to seed its stature, a race of man I've ever seen, the white haired man, who I knew was a good six feet in height sat on the head below any of them of the three. I found afterwards that really none were taller than myself. But their bodies were uh, very abnormally long and thin five heart and long legs short and curiously twisted. At any rate, they were an amazingly ugly gang, and they were under their heads of the, them. Well, anyway, they were an amazingly ugly gang, and under uh, over the heads of them, under the forward leg, peered the black face of a man whose eyes were luminous in the dark. So I stared at them, directed uh, my gaze, and then the first one, then the other one, turned away from my direct stare, looked at me in an odd, furtive manner. It occurred to me that I was perhaps annoying them. I, pro- I turned my attention to the island we were approaching. It was low and covered with thick vegetation, chiefly a kind of palm. It was new to me. One pint of thin white thread. Vapour rose, slanting to immense height, then frayed out like a brown f- down feather. And now within the brace of a broad bay, flanked either side by a low priority. The beaches of dull grey sound sloped steadily up to a ridge, perhaps sixty or seventy feet above the sea level, irregularly set with the trees and undergrowth. Halfway up was a square enclosure, some greyish stone, which I found subsequently was built partly of coral and partly of procumious lava. Two fetched roofs peeped through within its disclosure. Man stood waiting for us at the water's edge. I fancied while we were still far off I saw another, a very grotesque looking creature scuttled in the bushes upon the slope, but it's nothing that there was a few as we drew nearer. It was a man of the moderate size, a black, black necroid face. He was a large, almost limbless mouth, and extraordinary lank arms, long, thin feet, bow legs, and stood with his heavy face thrust forward, staring at me. He was dressed like Montgomery, his white haired companion, in jacket and trousers, blue, blue sage. He came still nearer. His usual began to run to the throw to the beach, making the most grotesque movements. A word of command from Montgomery, the four men and launch sprang up with singularity. Awkward gestures struck the lungs. Montgomery steered us round into the narrow little dock, excavated into the beach. And the men on the beach hastened towards us. His dock, I call, as they call it, was really a mere ditch, just long enough for his phase, a tide to take the longboat. I heard her bows ground into the sand, sway the dinghy off the, the rubber of the big boat, with me picking, a freeing the painter landed. The three muffled men, with the clumsiest movements, scrambled out upon the sand, and forthwith set the landing in the cargo, assisted by the man on the beach. I was struck especially by the curious movement of the legs, the three swayed and bandaged boatmen. Not still they were, 
but it's not as if they were, but it stood in some odd, almost as if they were joined, joined in some wrong place. The dogs were still snarling and strained in the chains of the, after these men, as a white-haired man landed with, an, with them. The young, the three big fellows spoke, one of them in old gruntled tones. A man who had waited for us, Beach began chatting to them excitedly, a foreign language, as I fancied, as they laid hands on but some bells piled near the stern somewhere. I heard of such a voice before. I could not think of where. White-haired man stood holding a tumult of five, six dogs brawling our orders over the din. The Montgomery, having unshipped the rubber, landed and likewise. All set the workers on loathing. I was not too faint, but it was was my last long sun beating down on my bare head to offer any assistance. Presently the white-haired man seemed to reflect my presence and came up to, to, to me. You look... He said he, though you scarcely breakfasted, his little eyes were brilliant black under his heavy brows. I must apologise for that. You know, now, now you are our guests, we must take make you comfortable, though you are not uninvited. Though you are uninvited, you know. He took keenly into my face. He looked keenly into my face. Montgomery says, educated man, Mr. Benwick, because you know something of science. May I ask what that signifies? I told him I spent some years at Royal College of Science, done some research in biology under Huxley. He raised his eyebrows slightly at once. That orders the case a little, Mr. Pendwick, he said with a little trifle more respect in his manner. As it happens, we are biologists here. This is a biological station of a sort. His eyes rested on a man in white who were quite more busily holding, who were busily hailing the puma rollers towards its waded yard. Yard and in Montgomery, at least, he yeah, I am and and I am Montgomery at last. At least, he added, and when you are able to get away, I can't say we're not attracted anywhere. We see a ship once in twelve months or so. He left us me abruptly, went to the, up to the beach, left the group. I think, and, and I think I I think I entered the closure. The two other men were the Montgomery. And, with Montgomery erecting a pile of small packages, a low wheeled truck, a llama still on the launch, those rabbit haunches, the stagons are still lashed on to the forwards. A pile of things completed, all three men laid hold of the truck, began shoving the ten ton weight or so upon it up after the puma. Presently Montgomery left them, and coming back to me, held his hand. I'm glad, said he, for my own part. Captain was all that was a silly ass. He made a, he never have made things lively for you. It was you, said I, that saved me again. A pens you find at this island and, and turn the one place up. I, I promise you. I watched my goings carefully, if I were you. He, he hesitated, and seemed to alter his mind about what was on his lips. I will wish you help me with these rabbits, he said. If his cure with the rabbits is singular. I waited for him and helped him lug one of the hutches ashore. As soon as that done, we opened the door of it, of it and tilting them on the one end, le- turned it living contents out of the ground. He fell in a struggling heap, one on the top of the other. He clapped his hands and forthwith they went off with that hopping speed. Well, there's fifteen or twenty of them. I should think up the beach increased the mud blow, my friend, said Montgomery. Finish the island, if though we had a certain lack of the meat here. As I watched them with his pen, the white-haired man returned with a brandy flask and some biscuits. Something to go on with Miss Bidwick, he said he, in a far more familiar tone than before. I made no ado, but set my work on the biscuits at once, while the white-haired man helped Montgomery to release about a score more of the rabbits. Three big hutches, however, went up to the house with a puma, a brandy I did not touch, for I had been an abstainer from my birth. Mm-hmm. 
Chapter 7, A Locked Door. The reader will perhaps understand. At first, everything was so strange about me. My position was the outcome of such unexpected adventures. I had no discriminant. The relative strangeness of this or that thing. I followed the little llama up the beach and was overtaken by Gromery. asked me not to enter the stone enclosure. I noted that a palmer puma in its cage, a pile of packages had been placed outside the entrance to this quadrangle. I turned and ran that, that, and saw that the launch, now being unloaded, ran out again, of being bleached. And an old white right man was walking towards us. He addressed Montgomery. Now comes the problem with his invited guests. What are we to do with him? He knows something of science, said Montgomery. I'm itching to get to work again, said the new stuff. With his new stuff, said the white man, hand man, nodding towards his closure, his eyes growing brighter. Dare say you are, said Montgomery, in anything but a cordial tone. He doesn't, he can't send him over there. He can't, he can't spare the time to build him a new sanctuary. We certainly can't take him into our confidence just yet. I'm in your hands, said I. No idea what it meant by over there. Been thinking, uh, thinking of some things, Montgomery answered. His room with, with, with the other, room with the other door. That's it, the older man, promptly looking at Montgomery. All three of us went towards the closer. I'm sorry to make a mystery. That good Mr. Debedick, do you remember you uninvited? Our little establishment here it contains a secret or so. It's kind of like Bluebeard's chamber, in fact. Nothing very driftful, really, to about do the same man. But just, as we don't know you, decidedly, said I, I should be fooled to take offence to any want of confidence. I twisted his heavy mouth with a faint smile. He's one of those centine, Saturnine people who smiled with the corners of the mouth down and bowed his acknowledgement, my compliance. A man in entrance to the enclosure passed his heavy wooden grate, framed in iron and a lot to the cargo of the launch piled outside of it. A corner we came. At a corner we came to the small doorway. I had not previously observed a white-haired man produce a bundle of keys from the pocket of his greasy blue jacket, opened his door and entered. His keys and elaborate looking up the place, it was even while it was still under my, his eye, struck me as peculiar. I had followed him and found myself in a small apartment, plainly but uncomfortably furnished with its inner door, it was slightly ajar. Opening into the paved courtyard, this inner door of Montgomery at once closed a hammock, was slung across the dark or corner of the room, a small unglazed window defended by an iron gate bar, looked out towards the sea. This, the white hand told me, was in my apartment, the inner door, which, for the fear of accidents, he said, would, would lock on the other side, where my limited, my limited inward. He called my attention to a conven- conventional do- chair before the window an array of old books. Chiefly, I found surgical works and editions of the Latin and Greek classics languages I could not read with any comfort of a shelf near the hammock. I left the door. He left the room by the outer door, as if to avoid opening the inner door at one again. We usually have my meals in here, said Montgomery, and then as if a doubt went out the other, after the other, I went to wrong to rule. I heard him call, and for the moment I did not think or notice. Then as I handled the books on the shelf, came to my conscious, where had I heard the name of the Montagu before? I sat down before the window, took out the biscuits, and they all remained, they still remained to me. I ate them with the excellent appetite, Montagu. Through the window, saw one of those uncomfortable men in white, packing a packaging case along the beach. Presently, the window frame held in me. Then I heard a key inserted and turned a lock behind me. Ah, a little while, a little while, heard through the do- door the noise of staghounds. Now, been brought up for the beach. They are not barking, but sniffing, growling in a curious fashion. I could hear the rapid patter of their feet and Montgomery's voice moving them. I was very much impressed by the collaborative secretary. Two men were guarding the contents of the place. For some time I was thinking that in 
and of the kind of capability familiar of the name of Montgomery, but so odd, the human memory that I could not but then recall the well-known name, public connection, and then my thoughts went to indefinable queerness. With a full man on the beach, I never saw such a gait, such odd motions as I pulled on, at the box. As he pulled out the box, I recall that none of these men had spoken to me, though most of them I had found looking at me at one time or another in a peculiar furtive manner, quite unlike the frank stare of your own sophisticated savage. Indeed, they all seemed remarkably tantantantan, and then they did, and when they did speak, and down with very uncanny voices, what was wrong with them? When they recalled the eyes of Montgomery's t- and gaily attendant, now as I was thinking of him, he came in. He is now dressed in white and carried a little tray with some coffee, boiled vegetables thereon. I had hardly repressed a shuddering recall as he came, blinding abruptly and abruptly, and placed a tray before me on the table. Then astonishment punished paralyzed me. Under his stream black locks, I saw his ear. I had jumped upon me, suddenly close to my face. A man with pointed ears, covered with fine brown hair. Sir, your breakfast, sir, sire. He said, I was stared at his face without attempting to answer him. He turned and went towards the door, regarding me oddly over his shoulder. I followed him out, my eyes, as I did so. By some odd trick of my conscious celebration, there, were, there came surging into my head the phrase, Mulroo Hollows. Was it Mulroo? Ah, went by my mem- I sent my memory back ten years, the horrible horrors. The phrase drifted loose in my mind for a moment, then I saw its red lettering on a little buff coloured pamphlet, read to read with one shiver and creep when I remembered distinctly all about it. That long forgotten pamphlet came back with startling vividness to my mind. I have me a lad then. I want to go with supposed about fifty prominent martyrful martyr, martyr psychologists, well known in scientific circles. For his extraordinary imagination, his brutal directness in discussions. A discussion. Was this the same Moreau? He had published some very astonishing facts in connection with transfusion of blood. This was known to be being viable work on morbid growths. As suddenly his career was closed, he had to leave England. Journeys obtained access to his laboratory. Laboratory and capability of the laboratory assistant, with deliberate attention making him sensational exposures by the help of a shocking accident. If it was an accident, his gruesome pamphlet became notorious. On the day of his publication, a wretched dog, frayed and otherwise moodily, escaped from Monroe's house. It was his silly season. A prominent editor, cousin of temporary laboratory assistant, appealed to the conscious nation. It is not the first time the conscious has turned down against his methods of research. The doctor has simply hounded out of the country. It not may be that he deserved to be, but I still think the tepid support of his fellow investigators, his desertion to this great body of scientific works, was a shameful thing, yet some of his experiments by the journalist's account were remotely cruel. He might p- perhaps have purchased his social peace by abandoning his investigation, but he apparently preferred the latter, as many as many men would have once fallen upon the a mastery spell of research. He was unmarried and even and had and indeed nothing but his own interest to consider. I, convinced, I felt convinced this might be the same man. Everything pointed to it. It dawned upon me he had, that, to that end the puma, the other animals, which had now been brought with the other luggage to close it around behind the house. It was destined, a curious fate odour, the hideous of some familiar, hiatus of some familiar, an odour that had been in the background of my subconscious hitherto, suddenly came forward into the forefront of my thoughts. It was the antiseptic odour of the dissecting room. I found the puma growling through the wall, and one of the dogs yelped as though it had been struck. Yet surely, especially and uh, to another scientific man, it was nothing so horrible in visitation as an account of his secrecy. By some odd leap in my thoughts, the pointed ears and numerous eyes of Montgomery came back again before, before me, with the sharpest definition. I shared dead before... before more out me out 
Will be out of the green grass seas, foaming under the freshening breeze. Let those who other strange, uh, let those and other strange memories of the last few days chase one over through my mind. What could it mean? A locked conclusion of Cordoni Island, notorious vicinity, and those crippled, distorted men.